So let's begin. Google Summer of Code is a project focused on introducing students to open source. What does that mean? First, let's understand what open source is. So open source is, first, there is a sort of like a legal official definition of it. What it means is that I'm just going to go through a very quick summary right now, because exactly what it means and exactly how it ties into the false culture, that is the important part we're going to talk about later. So in this website here, you can see some of its legal definitions. It just means basically you can distribute it. Basically, it's open code that you can distribute, fork and merge however you like, and don't be a jerk. That's open source for you. All right, so let's go back to GSOC. Now, introducing. What, from my understanding, how GSOC is aiming to introduce such a project is via this program, right? So 10-week programming project. Now, there is one thing that I have to know is that for 2021, GSOC changed their latest policy that it's always been 10 weeks. But for 2021, they cut the total hours in half like they cut the expected amount of contribution per week in half. They cited COVID as one of the reasons. However, we'll get into that later. Well, they also cut this stipend in half. But in general, okay, if we just sort of don't look at that change, in general, how GSOC works is that you're a student, right? And then there's organizations that you can look at. There's projects that you can undertake. And the organizations will usually have one, two, or three, or I don't know, a lot of mentors to guide you through your journey. Throughout this process, you will also be compensated monetarily with a stipend. And the main purpose is to get students comfortable and with the onboarding process of open source contributions. Because in general, the gap in the onboarding process can be a bit large sometimes, especially as I'm not sure about you, but personally speaking, I don't think open source is a, like you don't really hear about it in your university's classes usually. But let's get straight on. So now the important factors we're going to explain are one, my journey as a participating GSOC student for 2021, how I got rejected in 2020 and what I learned in between, the general idea of FOSS or FLOSS or free lead open source software and how the culture I think is quite important to a lot of the organizations in GSOC and going beyond GSOC into open source and what it really means and the kind of opportunities that kind of open your eyes and mind that's possible. So let's get started. A year ago, 2020, it was right before everything went down. I think it was March and then Polo and I were, uh, were basically just chilling and then Polo showed me this page. I'm like, okay. So this is basically the first page I ever saw of GSOC. And immediately, you might have noticed that if you just scroll down, it can be a bit daunting. There's a lot. There's a lot. Right. I mean, at least there's a back to top button. So where do you even start, right? I was like, whoa, where do you even start? I don't know where to start. But here's the thing, right? So GSOC has a lot of organizations. Now, these organizations, basically these organizations, they apply to be part of like one year's GSOC project, no, program. And then they would get approved by GSOC organizers. And, and I think it was early March, is it? Right, early March, the list of approved organizations. So this is the list for 2021. And so let's say you're, you just stumbled upon this. What do you even do? Like, what do you start? Well, first, I hope is that you understand, like I just said, what GSOC is aiming to do. It is meant to be a fairly not as much hurdled onboarding process to open source contributions. So before we even get into the organizations, let's talk about what does, how does, okay, so basically before talking about how introducing students work, we're going to talk about how open source contributions work. So let's take a look. Now, the organizations in here are pretty, I guess, not that small open source organizations. And here is the gist of it. That stuff I didn't realize before. Open source organizations are a bit like, oh, okay, it can either be an organization or it can be a community. 
So they're kind of like, just think of it as a bunch of people together with a common interest in the thing that they're developing. And I would say that I'm going to elaborate this later on, but I feel like the floss and foss culture is in a way the opposite of the Silicon Valley culture, which I will get into later. So it's a bit of more of a laid back sense. And okay, actually depending on what organization you're looking at, the culture of FOSS might be, have different magnitudes. But in general, the idea is, hey, we're a bunch of people, we're developing something, right? And I think open source in general thrive to make their hurdles as low as possible. And that's why they're part of this project program in the first place. Like when you apply to like industry, for example, like a, a job, an internship, that is what I call the Silicon Valley culture in a way, in the sense that you're competing with a lot of other people for like a position that is very cutthroat. I don't think it's an entirely constructive way of doing things, but hey, that's how big tech got those cash. So that's an entirely new discussion, like mon monitoring open source projects and essentially what kind of value people place in getting money is also a very big discussion, but we're going to talk about that later because that's moving on to societal topics. But for now, I will say that it's fairly laid back process. Like it's, you're not, if anything, I, do, I believe they want more people because the open source culture, at least from what I have siphoned, they tend to not like proprietary things, right? Okay, it's not like, okay, it's they don't like proprietary things. It's the fact that, okay, you know what? Here, here's what we're gonna do. Um, the culture, right? The culture, very laid back. So, you know what, how about this? Think about people making like a mod for a video game or something. You know, if you wanna contribute, you can just go walk up to them and be like, hey, I play this game too. Can I develop this mod with all of you guys? Of everyone here, of, whatever species you identify us. And I don't think they will have any problem with it. You can be a peacock and they will still um, love to have you there. It is, doesn't matter what you are, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter, doesn't matter if you are a matter or not. You can be dark matter for that aspect, but they're mostly very open in terms of contributions. And GSOC also shows because the, the bulk of your application is on what you want to achieve and how you plan to achieve it. Not necessarily your resume, not necessarily how high your GPA is, if GPA is even a viable way of measuring your capabilities, which I think it's not. I and many others think it's not. I think it's very bad at doing that or anything else too, for that matter. But that's a separate topic. Yes, I'm pretty sure you don't specify your GPA. No, 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 sorry, sorry. what I meant was, yes, you do not specify GPA, okay? What I meant is that this is entirely, open source contribution for the most part is based on what you want to achieve and how you want to achieve it. Who you are doesn't matter. Your resume doesn't necessarily matter either. Your GPA, no one cares about that. What I'm trying to say is, no, you don't, because, because I, I'm just sort of talking about my personal opinions here too. I think that GPA is not a very good way of doing anything, to be honest, and I'm not the only one who have that opinion. Yeah, but just something that we have in society, be like that sometimes, but, but that's that, right? So I feel like it's sort of like a laid back process that you wanna contribute, you contribute. Like you don't have to think of it as like this cut through process because last year, right? I was still in the process where like, because at University of Washington, the university that we are, this RSO is in right now, you might have known that the pre-major system is uh, undesired and unoptimized. And the admission system is also undesired and unoptimized. It's not good. It's not good at all. I think last year I was approaching it from a bit of a, that kind of mindset. Like, you don't, because I realized like tech isn't always cutthroat and competitive. I mean, I mean, a, 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 an arguable reason why big tech is is because it's artificially inflated because many factors. Again, we'll talk about humanity and social, social problems later. But that's the culture. If you're very laid back, you want to contribute, you contribute, okay? We don't care who you are. We don't care what you are. We don't care if some random institution is putting a number on your capabilities because that doesn't matter. 
So the schools are, don't face the major majors like you did us. I'm going to say competitive, you are going to them if you want. Well, in that case, yes, they do, because it's not, they don't have pre-major because their entire application system to get in, in the first place is very competitive. So that's, that's the, the reason why. So the reason why UW is so visible is because they take the students in and they're crying. Well, places like Stanford, MIT, well, students are crying, but they're not in the school, so they don't have to care about them. But they're crying somewhere because you can't escape from society. But I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later. Right, you're, you're absolutely right about that. They absolutely do face this problem. It, it just, it just, it has two different, it's it just in two different places. And because UW has it in the pre-major stage, it's more visible because those students are still at UW. Well, in those schools, they're still in society, but they're crying somewhere else. So those schools, they don't necessarily have to care about them. <sighs> Again, if you disagree with me on any of my stances, please speak up. I would love to have a constructive opinion a discussion. But that aside, very laid back, just relax. And we're going to go ahead and take a look at all the organizations. So depending, so GSOC is a giant bag of goodies and baddies and not goodies. But for the most part, it is a giant bag of mixed trail mix, something like that. I don't know. Heterogeneous mix. You have a lot of organizations. And really, I think as if you're interested, the first thing you should do is before you even look at the organizations, before you even look at the organizations, just close your eyes and think about what frame, like what am I interested in? Okay, so the, the order should be, it should be in this order. What am I interested in? And then it's how does my current experience, the frameworks I know relate to that. And then it's start selecting your organization. So for me, for both 2020 and 2021, actually, I know, I mean, okay, for 2020, I know I can only do basically iOS, not iOS, but like Apple ecosystem development with Swift UI because that was like my most fluent framework back then. In 2021, I'm also fluent in a lot, there's like some other frameworks. I'll explain why in the end, my project still has to do with the Apple ecosystem frameworks. So I just start thinking, I start thinking about it, right? I start thinking about it, hey, so basically in 2020, I thought that, hey, why don't I just scroll down and look at what, what projects have the frameworks I know? Because there's a lot of stuff here. Like all of these things use vastly different frameworks, right? And vastly different libraries and vastly different things that you might've gotten used to. So let's just go ahead and take a look at them. So you have something like something that's primarily web-based, such as this one. And this one, as you can see, is about geoinformatics. So it's not entirely about just tech, like tech and just tech. This one's about aerospace. This one's about graphics. And you might realize, you might see a lot of things that you might recognize. Hey, it's Audacity. Oh, C++. Okay, makes sense. Blender. Right. I mean, a lot of graphics rendering-based stuff. Eagle board, this one's for, oh, look, risk five. Very exciting. This one is embedded, so probably a bunch of lower level stuff. So you'll see a lot of lower level stuff and a lot of higher level stuff and big communities as well as small communities. So if you go down, right, you have CERN, HSF, the something physics related, Center for Open Source, so UC Santa Cruz. Interesting. Oh, the Chromium project. This is the base uh, foundation for browsers such as Chrome, what is it? Edge, Brave, and a lot of other things. And then you also have things like programming languages, Dart. You know, this is just a programming language. You also, okay, right, so you have like a project, right? Chrome, Chromium is a single project, right? Dart is a single language. You also have, look, an entire Linux distribution. That is interesting. So you have, you know, an entire Linux distribution. So this is possibly something that's going to be a bit lower leveled, but because it's the, it's the distribution itself, not the desktop environment or any of those, but look, you have Linux distributions, you have Fortran, which is a very old programming language. You have frameworks, such as MMMPEG. You have suites, software suites, such as LibreOffice. 
you have Matrix, which is the the open source decentralized uh, communication internet relay chat network thing. You have something like no, I don't want to go to Matrix. You have. And then you have basically oh look another distribution go down database development Python programming language CubeOS this one is the operating system Reactor with this one is also an operating system and then you are, okay stop selecting for it and then you have oh you have Swift which is another programming language and then you also have I miss I miss genome didn't I I think I did. I missed everything. Oh, oh wait. Oh yeah. That's that was one of the bugs we discovered. Is that some things could be missing for no apparent reason. <laughs> so um, in this case, there's just refreshes. Yeah. So some organization. I don't know why, but this bug was here last year. Some organizations can just disappear with no apparent reason. You see. You see this. This. This entire. This. I think these three rows weren't here before. But that's that. So you have something like. Oh yeah. Actually. I think an entire page was missing. So yeah, so, yeah, you know, a follow suggestion is interesting. So yeah, so basically you have all sorts of organizations from something that's about a single project like Chromium, from a distribution like Debian, or from a software a community such as Gino, or where's Kitty? Kitty. Like I think Gino and Kitty, for example, they have their own, they have their own Linux desktop environments. They have but they also maintain a lot of, especially KDE, a lot of applications, such as that that drawing thing. Polo was a drawing app again. The graphic. Uh, Krita. So and you also have they all they have a lot of things. Like KDE have a lot of things, and no, Genome is the uh, the Dasani model, so they also have a lot of things too. But so yeah, what I'm saying is something like KDE. They're gonna like they're likely going to have a lot of project opportunities because they're just they're just they're just they have their arms and eggs and tentacles extended in a lot of different places but something else like a single programming language for example like where swift Sw is swift gone is swift actually oh it's right here like for example this is what we're gonna likely gonna be talking about in the next two weeks but for example swift also has like something like a programming language there are things that you can still do on it but it's just different things like projects or the compiler itself. So in this situation, right. And also just for the record, you, you notice that Karita starts with a capitalized K. If a software starts with a capitalized K, it might, it, it is probably affiliated with the KDE community because they like to name all of their projects with a capitalized K. Like if you go in there, you will see that every single one of their, oh, right. Because their 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 terminal is called console with a K, their IDE is called K develop with a K, their video editor is called Caden Live with a K, and then their web browser is called Conquer with a K. So yeah, the only thing that's not called a K is their desktop environment is called Plasma, and their Fire Explorer is called Dolphin, which is not K, but everything else K. So let's say that. You selected something that you find very interesting. For example, this year when I started, because I started getting a bit deeper into the FOSS thing, like last year, mid last year, and then all the way through this year. So, um, so this year when I started, I was looking more on like Linux related projects. So, the first thing, the, oh yeah, XFCE is also a it's a Linux desktop environment, quite lightweight. Yeah. So basically, this year I basically looked at it. I went like, hey, you know, Linux Foundation, Debian, what else, KDE, and Genome. Those were the four things I kind of settled on. But I quickly realized that despite the fact that you have a limit of three applications, most likely you're not gonna have time to, like, if you can completely write applications about like two projects was in the same community that's already pretty good was in the the five weeks time frame i would say so yeah so a lot of other things were quickly dropped and i settled on on looking for stuff was in ade which is right here so let's say that you find something that you think is very let me just check that for a second karita right right it's on mac analytics well the reason why is because kde's principal framework is qt right it's on Qt and Qt can deploy on Mac and Linux pretty easily. But iOS, I don't know. So yeah, so let's say you 
you you you found something that you kind of like. Let's say you found something that you kind of like. What do you do now? Well, click on it. That's the first thing you do. And this is, I think, is one of the most confusing parts is how to reach these. Right, Qt can technically run iOS, Android, Linux in a web browser Windows. I understand that. However, one of the things is that KDE's Qt, actually they use a lot of their own framework. So just using the standard Qt frameworks will not work. And the second thing is, I don't think it's as well maintained on a lot of other things. Yeah, it's just the, the focus of the community for the most part is still on Linux. I, I, I feel like, because like Plasma also have a mobile version, but we'll get into that later. Right, so it's basically KDE's current implementation. It's, it's, it's a bit hard to get it across all platforms and especially get it well supported. But let's say that you found something interesting. Let's go ahead and click KDE. You know, you might choose to click learning equality or something like that. So let's say that you uh, you found something like learning equality or you found something like KDE. So what do you do now? Well, you basically click on this. So making contact, I feel like is one of, is one of the harder parts of open source. Immediately you'll be greeted to a couple of things. You'll, you'll see a chat, you'll see a mailing list and you see a contact email. Well, what I will recommend doing is, is well, first you can go to the website right? You want to the website. You, you, I will recommend instead of just tapping on these three, go to their website. They usually have a big get involved button somewhere. And I think this is exactly where, um, where one should start. Because if you go in here, it will give you a very quick rundown of how the development, how the community operates. And you probably need to find GSOC Pretty much all organizations in GSOC have a page on GSOC. So just search KDE, Google, some, we Google some of code. Right, so GSOC's uh, page in KDE. So what I did before I reached out was I read Get Involved thoroughly, pretty thoroughly. And I read about how their framework works, how to get it on your system and such. I read that. And then I read the GSOC page about programming languages, instruction for students, general instructions, and stuff like that. Now, most of these communities, they like to use internet relay chat and or matrix for communication. In KDE situation, in KDE situation, what I did, okay, is after I figured everything out, after I kind of know what I'm going to do, my first idea was actually not, okay, so communities usually have a list of ideas for GSOC, like a list of already submitted ideas that you can, oh, look, the link's right here. A list of already submitted ideas, not submitted, a list of ideas that already have mentors. And you can look such as pay my money. Ooh, interesting. Give me a second. Uh, if you go down, you can, you can see something like uh, port to Mac OS. Actually, well, a better example is here, for example. Go down, you look at Krita, right? You look at Krita, you want to do something about Krita. Hey, look, there's on a, a project that's already set up. What you want to do, knowledge prerequisites, and go to contact. So what I did is, my first idea is was about accessibility. So I actually tried to reach out to whoever's in charge first. So KDE, they have a... a, a I guess custom matrix communication and, and yeah, matrix is, is that thing is one of the organizations we saw up here. So it's quite, uh, let me give one second community. So if you just search KDE matrix, now I think KDE has a pretty nice way of doing this. Like genome, for example, you, you need to use internet relay chat and you need to figure out how to like authenticate yourself. But for the most part, this is pretty simple. So what I did is I, the first thing I did is I, basically got my matrix up. And in this case, KDE's repository is called KDE Invent. But what you can do is if you look at a project that you like, you can just search that project source. Like for example, if I just search like KDE Connect source, you'll most likely come across a GitHub link that's gonna tell you where the actual link is hosted. Cause a lot of these communities like to have it read only mirror on GitHub while keeping some sort of a, right. So to contribute your patches, use KDE Connects GitLab. So that's usually how you get there. So I click it, we're in, right? We are in GitLab. 
and you have this project right here. Now, one of the things you might have noticed is a lot of the communities, basically, they want you to fix something, right? Because like, if you're really interested and you're really passionate, you should be able to fix something. Now, basically what I did is, okay, so my first idea didn't actually turn out to be so well because it appears that I couldn't really find a mentor for it. So the, the second thing I did was basically, this was like not very much time left before the deadline. So in this idea, I just scroll down, just look, 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 look at what I'm potentially uh, interested in. I just sort of like went all the way down and then I, I realized, hey, look, KD Connect for iOS. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. And I read this, I was like, that's nice. Oh, brand new application service, also welcome. That's very nice. As you can see here, usually the repo is actually also just straight up linked inside like the GS page itself. So you don't even have to search for it. And for me, in this case, I the, the mentors are listed here. So I basically went, I went into the KDE Connect channel on Matrix. I tried to contact them, but they didn't reply. But it turns out what happens is they just like to use Telegram more than the Matrix. So I went on Telegram and I started talking to them and that's how it got started. So in my situation, I got talking with them and I start taking a look at the source. Actually, you know what? I'll just, I'll just sign in actually. Yeah, so it, most um, open source communities in their uh, own in their own repository, they usually recur like a account of some kind to, to start contributing. So I just created one and I just, I just started looking around projects, can you connect out? So, so I stumble across this and I start looking at it, right? I start looking at it. I start looking at it. I'm like, what can I possibly do with it? And it quickly, though, this is a special case because this isn't something that you are going to encounter. This is a bit of a special case because usually when you go on a project, you'll see that it is very actively maintained, <laughs> such as not only not my projects. I don't want to search, not my projects, explore projects, uh, filter red and key. No, so if you look at the Android app for it, you'll see that it is quite active. Merge request an hour ago, merge request 29. And for my project, it is a bit interesting because I quickly realized that, I go ahead and take a look at, where's the list activities? To take a look at activities, you'll see that, okay, so one more, that, that's me, by the way, this is, this is one of the mentors who are doing stuff. And you notice that one month, one month, one month, right? Four months, five months. And these changes are pretty small. Seven months, seven months, seven months, seven months, seven months, okay. And then all of a sudden, a year, a year, a year, wait. Oh wait, it doesn't go back. It doesn't go back. Hold on. Not merge events. I have to take a look at not repository. What button is it again? Uh, I think it's this. No, no, no. Uh, give me one second. Oh, repository commits. I quickly came to realize that this project actually, see it's 2019 and then it just suddenly jumps to 2014. So it turns out that this project came out of a came out of GSOC 2014, actually. So this is pretty much a seven year old code base. And uh, yeah, and basically that's when I realized what this project is going to be about, right? So I will say that by this point in your GSOC exploration, you have explored the source code, explored the commits log, and you probably have a pretty good idea of what, what this, the project you're about to apply for actually is about. So I realized what this is about. It's we've got a really old code base here, right? I gotta do something about it. So what I did essentially is I start looking at things that I can potentially fix. I look in the folders. Give me one second. I mean I mean the first thing I did is I cloned the thing, I cloned this thing, the code base to my own computer and I I was surprised that I actually managed to build a seven year old code base onto the latest version of iOS without anything going wrong. And upon opening it, I was greeted with what looked like a scaled up iPhone 5S interface. And I immediately know this is gonna be interesting. So the key part of your GSOC application is the proposal. I mean, that's like the only part actually. 
pretty much. And that is what I meant earlier by it depends on what you want to achieve and how you're going to achieve. So like no resumes, no GPAs, none of that. Just who you, it doesn't even matter who you are, just how you're going to achieve things. Okay, so yeah, this is about that. And you might have realized that by this time. So you have the code, right? So the other thing that you should do when you're at this step is that you can just go ahead and look at the code and just think about how you can, how you can make changes to it, improve it, do something to it, anything goes. For me, I, I basically build it to my phone and I notice something very odd is that it is not functioning properly. And then I try to go into the network stack of it to try to figure out what's wrong. And I did somehow, I did find a couple issues and I did try to make a merge request that fixes those, fixes those issues. So yeah. So by this point, I know what are the issues, how I'm, what are the issues with the problem with the project right now? how I'm going to use my goal to fix those issues, how I'm going to basically do all of this, because after looking at the code base, I now have a, a much better understanding of what is going on. So at this point, you should be fairly acquainted with the code base and you should be able to write out a pretty nice proposal. So in my proposal, what I essentially did is that and we'll go over this uh, very, very quickly because pretty much this is the last thing that you have to know. So let's go ahead and take a look at the proposal. So in my proposal, what I did essentially is that, is that I started with the, the title, a bit about myself, the things that, which we call um, the things that basically my contact information and such and such. And then a bit about, basically a bit about my experience with FOSS and FLOSS, what I know about the project, what I've done so far, talk to some mentors. And then I moved on to talk about what the current situation of the project is. And I listed some problems here and hey, I want to fix them. So the implementation plan consists of, I divided up into three major goals on how I'm going to um, meet them and the deliverables that I will be able to deliver during the GSOC timeframe. And the last section of the proposal is simply the timeline. So I divided them up basically into one week chunks about what I'm going to do each week, deliver each week and present every couple of weeks or so. And that's about it really for the proposal. So that is about it for the GSOC application process. So once again, for a recap, it is a bit like, it is a bit like exploring the, okay, so the steps most likely will be first understanding open source and FOSS and FLOSS. Second, understand how GSOC is going to work. Third, start looking at organizations and go in and start looking at what you might be interested in. Look at their, their code base, try to fix things. And by then you should have all the ideas and goodies you need to write a very good proposal. And there are some technicalities about GSOC, such as how stipends work, how work permits work. And for those, I would recommend everyone to check out the how it works section. Other than that, I think that is mostly the GSOC process, application process. And that is right. Those are the steps to take. And um, of course, again, open source is a very open and uh, free thing to juggle around. So yeah, do whatever you please. And that is GSOC application for you. So as uh, a conclusion to GSOC, that is about all for the GSOC application process. And once again, a reminder about the timeline is that the list of organizations are usually released in early March and the students will, uh, you will usually have until mid April to submit their application. So just keep that in mind. And again, we hope that everything that's been said in this session has been helpful. If you have any questions, please reach out to us at AppDev.
um, at UDOF. Happy uh, exploring and happy floss, floss, everyone. I will see you sometimes in the future, maybe. I don't know. But yeah, happy floss and happy floss.